Utah Solar Energy Association, which is an industry trade group that is uh, attempting to kind of make sure that providers are, are uh, up to speed and that the people who have the expertise actually do. Um, Gerald's principal business is in solar contracting and lead building certification, am I right? Uh, I do a little bit with these. A little bit with lead. We, we tried to get them here. I don't know whether they sent materials or not. Lead is an organization that certifies they work primarily with architects and uh, and design buildings and office spaces, workspaces, which are uh, which are energy uh, renewable energy compliant and friendly. But at any rate, I uh, would like you to welcome Gerald Gerald Whipple with Solar Unlimited. Explain the way the basics of the way solar works and uh, talk about some of the net metering and some of the things that I've learned in the, in the time that I've been doing this. So it's a very simple process, whether it's solar or wind. So let's say it's solar. So during the day, when the solar panels are producing power on a net metering system, you will consume that power first before you take from the utility, thus lowering your demand. So if you're short during the day, it just takes from the utility. And if you have excess, but you're not con consuming it all, then it will go back to the utility, thus giving you a credit. And just like Mark was saying, that the net metering program is exactly that, to lower your energy costs and your demand. So I, uh, I don't advocate a lot of uh, overproduction, as Mark was telling you some of the, uh, the reasons as far as the, the, the cost that you get, the price that you get back. Uh, I think no more than 75% of your average annual bill is pretty much where you're going to be for a, uh, a cost-effective system. I don't feel that Rocky Mountain Power should subsidize all of the solar energy with people doing that in the systems. However, my comment was to make it part of the Blue Sky Program. Now, the Blue Sky Program right now, there's over 60,000 people who have voluntarily signed up for and if you read on uh, Rocky Mountain Power's website, it's for renewable energy. It's not just for commercial wind. So people, just like Mark was saying, that you know you sign up and pay a little bit more money per month for amount, a certain amount of energy. We would like to see that little bit extra actually going to an individual who has a solar or wind net metering system on their home to get a little bit better value for the energy that they're feeding back the utility. There again, Rocky Mountain Power is, is a for-profit company, and that's okay. So my intent or my, in my comment, like I said, if they can make it part of the Blue Sky program, they're not subsidizing and losing. It's actually everyone volunteering to pay a little bit extra to help pay for this renewable energy. And it's, it's a good mix. It's, it's, I think it's a fair shake for Rocky Mountain Power. It's a fair shake for the, uh, the person who's spending, you know, 12, 15, 20 thousand dollars, whatever dollar amount they're spending, to put some solar or wind on their home to do this. And so what they do here again, they get instead of avoided cost or 50 percent, 50 cents on the dollar, I think we get a one for one for that. Also, at the end of the calendar year, I would like to see at least wholesale price for that energy that's been backfed as excess. Now they have picked a, a certain month. Uh, you know, which is good and bad depending on who you look at it. I think it's bad for farmers. It may be bad. It may be okay for residential. So, you know, there's there's some differences there that I think the, the Serv public service commission should address, and I think they will. They're they're very open about that. So, I think it's very important if you want if you have an opinion, if you really want to express that, that's that's definitely the avenue to express your opinion. Uh, I feel I, I work with Rocky Mountain Power and do a lot of net, net metering. I work with Dixie Escalade Lawns. I work with Garkane, uh, the city of St. George, Washington City, Hurricane City. We do a lot of systems in a lot of areas, and the utilities are usually very open and, and, and workable with that. Uh, the city of St. George, for instance, is that they're their own municipality. So they supply their own power. They have a rebate program that they'll pay uh, on average $2 per, per watt. Uh, they will give you a one per one credit. For what you back feed them, they give you that kilowatt back. At the end of the calendar year, they will pay you avoided cost. Uh, Hurricane City does the same thing. They do not have a rebate. Well, it is. It's, it's done a little differently. Uh, and then Washington City also will give you a one-for-one -one and pay you for the excess. 
So there's already uh, utilities out there that are already doing some of this. And uh, I think the thing with Rocky Mountain Power being a for-profit entity is the fact that if it could become part of that Blue Sky program, I think it, it doesn't put a lot of uh, pressure upon them as far as a, a, a budget or financial uh, burden. And then there again, it's picked up by people who volunteer to actually uh, join the program. So it's, I think it's a very simple solution, but you know, we'll see what the PSC says on that. Any questions thus far? One of the things before, I don't want to inter interrupt questions, but one of the things we wanted to do in the midst of all of this discussion of megawatts and, and uh, macro scale kinds of production, we wanted to bring this down, in some of the discussion anyway, down into how does a guy like Mike Lorton, who says, well, gee, I have a detached garage, a two-car garage, and I think I can afford maybe a few solar voltaic cells on, you know, to put up on the top of it, and then, and then maybe two or three years from now I'll add, I'll add more, and especially since uh, one of the nice things uh, about having a new administration coming in right now is that it looks like they're going to be awfully friendly to Michael Horton regarding the kinds of tax credits and, and uh, the opportunities I'll have to install this equipment, even though it's going to cost me a lot at the beginning, to install this equipment on my, the roof of my garage and then make it work. So what I've asked uh, Dr. Walt Saunders from, um, from Utah State to do is to describe what he's done personally at his garage. Uh, I need to clarify, I'm not with Utah State University anymore. I'm sorry, retired. <laughs> and I go by the name of Walt. When I was working up there, I'd tell my students, okay, you see me in the hallway, you just call me Walt. If you see me walking with the university president, you say, hi, Dr. Sellers. Uh, really love your class. What else are you teaching? <laughs> your grade will go. Help your grade. Well, I wanted to talk just very briefly. So I made a handout here. And the first page you can read, it just says that I wanted to. And uh, so this is not photovoltaic. This is solar, solar thermal. So these are uh, hot water collectors that go on the roof, solar panels that go on the roof. And then uh, there will be storage. So, so there will be hot liquid flowing through the, the pipes from the solar collectors on the roof. And it's um, water diluted with ethylene glycol, which is the antifreeze that we use in our uh, RVs and stuff like that. And, uh, rigged up so that it'll drain out of the collectors back into the storage in the garage every night and every every hot summer day. If the temperature of the collector gets over 180 degrees, then um, it kind of starts breaking down the ethylene glycol antifreeze. And so you don't want those collectors to get too hot in the summer. So drain it out in the summertime. Drain it out at nighttime when it gets cold, because one of the mistakes that's often made in uh, this kind of business is forgetting to put antifreeze in there and forgetting that we live in a freezing climate. And the collectors break open, they spring leaks when they freeze, and then the liquid comes down, and in many applications it comes down, gets on your ceiling, weakens the sheetrock, and the sheetrock falls off your ceiling. A lot of, a lot of water damage. So, that, in essence, is a brief description of the project. Are the solar collectors installed on the roof yet? No. Uh, is the control equipment installed? No. Is the economy in the U.S. in bad shape? Yes. <laughs> so, I'm trying to look at my crystal ball and tell, should I spend some more money on this and get it finished now, or should I wait a year or two? I don't have a lot of time to wait around, let me tell you. I've been around on the planet for quite a few years. Don't know how many I have left, but uh, that's where we're at right now. So this is a progress, a work in progress. And good. if you hear that in the next quarter, the Obama administration is going to make it very worth your while to do one of these two things, you may want to, to, to run the numbers and start you know, accessing people like Gerald or his council, the the uh, industry trade group that he represents, 
or uh, Doc Saunders right here in Richfield and say, gee, you know, I understand there's money out there available that will help me defer some of my heating costs and maybe I'll be, uh, maybe the break-even point will be three years from now instead of five. These are the people um, in your midst that are actually doing this work, certified, licensed, bonded, and insured in the case of uh, uh, Mr. Whipple, to, to actually come and do this kind of work in your home. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, do you have charts and things like that? I guess that's why you encourage these kind of things, because have you noticed that pattern in peak demand as far as energy use? Yes, two times a year, maybe. Well, it depends. I mean, you know, a lot of people have uh, natural gas heat. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially if you've got natural gas. Uh, so, which means that your, your peak usage for electricity is going to be more near summer, depending on what you do. But, you know, if you, if you have to look at your individual bill. Uh, on average, one kilowatt or a thousand watts of solar is going to produce somewhere in this region of around 175 kilowatt hours per month. So if you take your utility bill, you take your kilowatt hours, you can divide that by 175 and that will give you uh, a rough number. But there again, I don't advocate any more than 75%. And usually uh, the economics plays a role to work. It's going to be somewhere around the 50% mark is what I usually wind up selling people. Thank you. I'd like to 